This screencast builds on the previous one and looks at how we achieve appropriate step length. It is based on the use of eBurn. If you are working in PowerPoint then you can interact with the model here by dragging with the mouse on the various segments. If not, go to www.richard.net. You might have to edit the PowerPoint presentation to stop the slide progressing automatically if you want time to do this. Click on the Step Length button to position Vern in the pose at foot contact during normal walking. Note that whenever you see an image that has a blue background, it's a screen capture of Evern and you will not be able to interact with it. If you think about it, step length is determined at foot contact. In most common patterns, whether normal or pathological, once a part of the foot has made contact with the ground, it stays where it is. It is virtually impossible to slide the foot forwards once it has landed and is weight bearing. If you want to make the stride longer, then you have to make the foot contact further forwards. Of course, where this is depends on how the leg has been moving during swing. Although step length is determined by the pose at foot off, how we have achieved this depends on the movements that have occurred throughout the swing phase. The stationary vertical black line in Vern marks the normal step length in terms of ankle position. The coloured variable line shows where the ankle joint is in any particular pose. If it's green, then the step length is longer than normal. If it's red, then the step is shorter than normal. Some things are quite obvious. The more you flex the leading hip, the longer the step length is going to be. The more extended the trailing hip, the longer the step length is going to be. In fact, if you think about it, what is important is not the individual hip angles, but the angle between the thighs at the moment of foot contact. I think it's also obvious that if the leading knee is flexed, then the step is going to be shorter. What is not at all obvious is that if the trailing knee is flexed at the time of initial contact, then the step will be longer. You might have to play with Eburn for a short time to convince yourself of this. By tilting the femur and body backwards, you are allowing the leading femur to reach further forwards before foot contact occurs. If we actually do some mathematics, we can work out just how much longer a 10 degree difference in each of the joint angles at the time of foot contact will make the step length. As remarked, the angle between the two thighs is the most important determinant of step length, leading to a 21% increase in step length for 10 degrees difference in thigh angle. If you want a decent stride length, you really have to extend and flex your hips. Flexing the leading knee reduces the step length by a little less than half as much as reducing hip flexion by the same amount. Flexing the trailing knee increases step length by a similar amount. Allowing the trailing heel to rise has a small effect, but not very much in comparison to the knee and hip joint angles. From a clinical perspective, it can be seen that step length will be increased most easily by concentrating on hip movement, with some refinement being achieved by knee movement. Although we're dealing in two dimensions, it's reasonably easy to calculate how much effect pelvic rotation will have on step length. You can see this is actually quite modest. Contrary to what most clinicians think, pelvic rotation only has a very small effect on step length. This is because the hips are actually quite close together and quite large angular movements are required to affect step length significantly. It is only in patients with the very shortest of step lengths that pelvic rotation is likely to influence step length significantly. We can use what we have learnt in this screencast to see how the requirements for an adequate step length are reflected in the gait graphs. Step length is primarily determined by the difference between hip extension in the trailing limb and hip flexion in the leading limb at the instant of foot contact. Remember that because of the way the gait graphs are formed, you need to look at different time points on the left and right traces to assess this. Hip extension for the trailing limb is indicated opposite foot contact, whereas hip flexion for the leading limb is indicated at foot contact. Step length is also helped by good knee extension at foot contact, but we already have this. Some trailing knee flexion at opposite foot contact is also beneficial. It can be seen that this brings our knee curve 
a little closer to that found in the normal data. The main clinical finding from this screencast has got to be the importance of range of hip motion in achieving reasonable step length. In many patient groups, reduced range of motion at the hips is the most likely cause of reduced step length, and increasing hip movement is the most direct way to restoring this. It is quite obvious that patients will benefit from achieving more hip flexion at foot contact, but we need to remember that achieving hip extension on the other side is equally important. Excessive knee flexion at foot contact will often be more obvious and may well be a contributory factor, but shouldn't distract from a primary focus on the hips.